Well, anyone who knows me knows that uh, a large portion of my spare time money goes for uh, jazz records. And uh, one of the names that occurs most frequently on the labels is that of alto saxophonist Jackie McLean. Uh, my favorite jazz group was for a long time the Jazz Messengers, and this is why Jackie McLean's name showed up. Uh, it now has been some months, I know, maybe even some years, since you've appeared with that group, Jackie. I wonder if you could uh, tell the radio audience a little bit about what has happened to you since you've left the Messengers. Well, I've uh, I worked around New York for a while. And most recently, for the last four months, I've been working in an off-Broadway play entitled Connection by Jack Gelber. Mm -hmm. I took two or three months of dramatics, and uh, I've just been in a play in New York City, and that's it. And I came up here and made this job for two weeks, you know. I'm not quite sure uh, what to make of your uh, career during the past four months. You tell me you've been uh, taking part in a play. Uh, Jackie, can you explain a little bit about uh, what this play is all about? Well, the play is uh, its about the drug problem throughout the country, which is a big problem that isn't being coped with by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics or anybody. So Jack Gelber sat down and wrote a play about the real drug situation. And uh, he needed some musicians to portray musicians that were playing modern jazz that happened to be hooked. And, uh, of course, it, it entailed acting as, for, uh, as much as it did, you know, as playing an instrument. So I went and studied with Judith Molina, who was an actress in New York and a director and a teacher. And I studied with Judith for two months and learned how to act a little bit. Well, I've been acting since the day I was born, really. We were all acting, actually, but uh, it, it all panned out nice, and we won an, an award, and we're getting ready to go to Europe in a couple of months. And I have an understudy, Tina Brooks, who's taking my place now while I'm here in Minneapolis. But that's, that's just it. It's a play. You have to see it. Maybe it'll come through Minneapolis one of these days. The Connection by Jack Gelber. Uh, some of the uh, records in my collection uh, date back five, six, seven years, of course, and uh, a young Jackie McLean is <laughs> playing on these records, and I know I've uh, followed your career, and uh, you've had some uh, wonderful jobs, among them that with the Jazz Messengers, and certainly there must have been uh, several very important influences that have uh, brought about a stylistic change in your playing since those very early days. Uh, could you tell our radio audience a little about these influences? Well, uh... I don't need to say that my first and most important influence was Charlie Parker, who I followed around as a kid, 15, 16 years old. And I was too young to go into clubs, but Bird would always uh, take me in the club and let me hear a set. We were very friendly, even up until he passed away. But uh, a few years before Charlie Parker passed away, I began to think about other things as far as playing alto saxophone and my conception changed a little bit I began to lean more towards Miles Davis uh, I still lean toward his conception playing fewer notes and uh, more or less making the notes that you play mean as much as uh, a multi-note phrase you know with many notes and uh, Lester Young has been an influence Dexter Gordon and currently among the saxophone players, I enjoy listening to John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins, or Sonny Rollins and John Coltrane, I don't mean to call anyone's name first, among the tenor saxophonists. Alto saxophone players don't impress me uh, too much. I listen to tenor saxophonists mostly, and uh, but among the alto saxophonists, I like uh, Cannonball, Lee, Lou Donaldson, Lee Konitz, Hal McCusick, uh, or Ornette Coleman, it's all of them, I like them all, but I choose to listen to tenor saxophonists mostly. But Miles Davis and Bud Powell, who was the first person to ever help me musically, Miles Davis, Bud Powell, and Charlie Parker, and Dexter Gordon, and Lester Young, those are my main influences, John Coltrane. Among uh, saxophone players uh, today, the name of Ornette Coleman uh, seems to be coming up more and more frequently. I've uh, seen his name on some record albums. I'm not too familiar with his playing, but uh, perhaps you are. Uh, could you tell us something about this uh, up-and-coming personality? 
I've only heard one record by Ornett Coleman, and uh, I think that he, as far as composition is concerned, he is going up some different avenues, like he's, instead of playing chord changes, <coughs> he's more or less following the scale pattern, which Miles Davis has been doing. But uh, as far as being very original and uh, such a, a rave, more or less, I, I would have to say that on it has a like a rough tone like I have and have had for years and I don't know whether he's contented with it or not but the way he's playing I think that maybe three or four years he would, might develop into something that might be very interesting but as far as saying that he's uh, the new Charlie Parker unquote which uh, Max Roach said he was a new Charlie Parker. I won't go along with that. <clears throat> He's a new one at Coleman, and <laughs> Charlie Parker's dead. Jackie McLean, you've mentioned Charlie Parker, and it always comes to mind this is a man whose personality and his relationship to jazz music is so great and his influence so great, we never got to know him as a personal sort of human being. I knew him as a man who liked to sit and listen to symphonies, everything from Bartok to, uh, oh, the very, uh, the very traditional in, in symphony music. W what, what sort of a man was Charlie Parker to you? Well, Charlie Parker, to me, was like, uh, well, like an uncle or something, because I looked up to Charlie so much that whenever I was in his company, he sort of resumed, uh, you know, he took on an air of being like, uh, Uncle Charlie, and that was in my teenage years, but when I reached 21, 22, and began to have real man problems, Charlie took on a different picture altogether with me. He became like a, a great musician, looking down on a little alto player that was trying very hard. But Charlie always liked the way I played, and he always encouraged me, and... Uh, he was always very warm to me and nice to me. And uh, I think that out of all the musicians I've met, that Charlie Parker was uh, the greatest personality. Like, I could, I've seen Charlie Parker sit up and talk to old people, people that, from the church, people that didn't have anything to do with jazz at all, and be very interested and stay right in their realm and talk. I mean, these are things that may not interest other people, but they interested me because I love Charlie Parker so much that I watched his every move. And every time that I could be around him, naturally I watched, you know, everything that he did. But he, uh, as far as music was concerned, he never told me anything musically or showed me anything. He just more or less, I just was around him and saw things and just took up what I could get away from him, you know. Just learned as much as I could just by watching him and talking to him. Jackie McLean, having associated with Charlie Parker so closely, we might ask you, what did you learn from him about music, about playing your horn, about uh, jazz? What I learned from Charlie Parker, I didn't learn from him. I learned from records. Now's the time, Billy's Bounce, everything that he ever recorded, I sat and listened to him. Then one day I met him, and it was a different type of school. It's like going to school to learn how to, how to box and then going and watching Joe Lewis on a film. It's the same, same type of thing. I, w I listened to Charlie Parker and practiced his little things that I love so much. Instead of practicing out of saxophone books, I practiced from Charlie Parker records. And then I went to the clubs, and I, when I got old enough to go in a club, I started playing when I was 15. When I was about 18 or 19, I started going in clubs, and I just watched him and listened to him. And that's the only schooling I ever, you know, that I could say that I got from him. Actually, he never sat down and talked to me about playing the saxophone. I knew that that, uh, that he liked the way I played from his different, from the different experiences I had with him. I remember one time in Arthur's Bar in the village, there was a whole group of people in there, a lot of musicians, and Charlie was playing on the stage. And he started a tune, and he, when he finished playing his solo, he got up and came out into the audience. And he put the horn around my neck, and I went up and played. So I knew that, you know, he approved, to do what, you know, he approved of what I was playing. And a couple of times, I was had the life scared out of me. I was working with Miles Davis's band, and he just walked in Birdland and took out his horn and came up on the bandstand. And my heart was in my mouth, but he more or less told me like, 
you know, don't worry, kid, go ahead and play. And he's comforted me more or less, you know. So I know that he, if, because Charlie, if he didn't like the way he played, he more or less, you could see it in his attitude and different things. But as far as sitting me down and saying, this is C and this is B and different things about music, he never did that. I learned everything from records, from watching him, and from listening to him play and talking to him. No, no actual saxophone lessons or anything like that. Uh, Jackie McLean, those things that uh, influence jazz musicians are not always uh, jazz music exclusively. Uh, in my case, uh, classical pipe organ music is my dear love. Uh, we were talking with you a little bit earlier, and I think you have some other dear loves besides jazz, too. Um, we, could you elaborate a little bit on this? Yes. Uh, I didn't have any dear loves, as you dear loves, as you affectionately call them, until 1955. I began to listen to some classical composers. Uh, at first I listened to Stravinsky and Bartok and the people that I heard Charlie Parker talk about. But lately I've been listening to uh, one composer, Francois Polanc. He was one of the French Five back in uh, 1931, 1932. He's written some beautiful things. And uh, as far as buying jazz records, Lately, I've been buying uh, John Coltrane's records and Miles' records. But other than that, uh, the rest of my collection is mostly modern classics. Stravinsky and Bartok, people like that. I don't know, it just fascinates me to listen to, to people that have been playing uh, on another route, sort of driving on another turnpike, but heading for the same destination as jazz musicians. But uh, I would like to say that more people should listen to Francois Polanc. I don't think anybody's ever heard of him but me. But I, I think that if, if you went to the record shop and you more or less asked about him, you, you'd hear some very beautiful music, modern, and yet it has a uh, nostalgic feeling to it without getting real classical, you know. Because I don't like, I don't want to say I don't like him, but I, I don't, the early classical musicians, I don't know, it's just, it's obvious. It's like listening to Dixieland, except for Mozart and Bach and Beethoven. But the rest of them is just, just well, I don't want to get on a classical topic anyway. <laughs> uh, Jackie McLean, there are some jazz players uh, who, strange as it may seem, really don't like to play the blues at all. But uh, you do, and we really enjoy listening to you. Uh, what is there about the blues that uh, holds such a fascination for you? Well, it's, it's not a fascination. It's more or less an escape. It's like uh, uh, taking an escalator rather than run up some stairs. Uh, the blues has been, well, being a Negro, and my people came from North Carolina. Uh, my grandmother used to take me to the Sanctified Church in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I really first began to get a, uh, a definite feeling of a beat as a young child, five, six years old. And then as I began to listen to music, Charlie Parker played a lot of the blues, so therefore I began to play a lot of the blues. And it's just a culture, it's just a thing that, that you grow up with, more or less, you know. Like other musicians, European musicians, I was talking to you earlier and you told me about their feelings about it. I can understand. It's just like me listening to Chinese music and copying down some changes. And then when I get over there and I really understand how they work in the rice fields and, uh, and uh, really get the start of this music it would make take a different effect on me so blues to me is like cornflakes in the morning you know it's ABC's you know it's something that I can escape in like if I can't think of nothing to play I'll say well let's play some blues and B flat because I know I'm safe there you know